But there's your slides, and you can just lean up and hit the. This, this guy doesn't go all the way over there, so. That's right. That's right. That's good. Thank you, Dr. P. Thank you, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. It's good to see everyone here. Yeah. Okay. I just want you to know, preface my talk by saying that I was born and raised in, in New York City in the South Bronx, so it's always good to come back to the great state of New York. <laughs> Um, I love New York, and um, I do live in Washington, not in Washington, I live in Virginia, but I'm trying to make a purple state. <laughs> um, and we are trying, we're going to try our darndest to make it purple, okay? So um, one of the things that I do, and I've been doing this job for about 18 years now, I don't know how time flies, but it does, um, is to I really try to bring a better perspective of how Nurses interact with the political and policy making process. And I, what I heard in my, in my travels is that nurses traditionally want to get engaged in policy. Oh, we have to change policy. Oh, we have to do this X, Y, and Z. But let's talk a little bit about politics. And they go, oh, I'm not doing politics because politics is really nasty, dirty, and sleazy. And if you think about, you know, how nurses are judged as one of the most trusting professionals, right? We rated, I think, at 84%, the highest that we have been in, in, in ever, and, and most of the time. And the only time anybody has ever trumped us was 9-11 with the firefighters, mm -hmm. right? Well, lobbyists, which I am a registered lobbyist in, the, in D.C., because you have to be, according to a lot of the laws that have changed and mandated people to register to be lobbyists, so uh, they're based at, as the most trusty professional, their average rate is 7%. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, about, they have about a 64% rate of people who do not trust them, at least. You know, they don't trust them, they don't like them. So I am kind of, I am a nurse lobbyist. Where does that put me? And, you know, lobbyists really have a really nasty image about themselves, especially with people with, Abramoff and whatever, I don't know if you remember Abramoff who really took a lot of money, was quick pro quo, quo, made a lot of money related to lobbying. He had a nice pack. He had a nice pack. <laughs> and he's back making money after serving time in prison. You know, this is interesting. I, I know a lot of people that I know that went to prison are not out making money mm -hmm. and they come out. But um, anyway, so, um, you know, he's making money now. And so, but I view lobbyists as really educators. My job is to really educate members of Congress and their staff on issues that are important to nursing. So why do I do this? Well, I'm hired by the American Nurses Association to do this. And, you know, ANA, if, if you are not familiar, that is, it is a professional organization. And it has, um, its mission is to advance our profession to improve the health of all. We take that seriously and we work really hard at trying to ensure that we're working in that direction. And, you know, if you have questions, I'm going to make this, if you want to stop me, because I do a lot of lectures, kind of, but I want this to have a conversation, but I want to start to give you some information so that you can then jump in at any time. So this is a little bit about our purpose, ANA's purpose. And I am, I, I am employed by the American Nurses Association. I've been there for 18 years. I think it's a great organization. And I think the way I look at how we do our work is really about we think about nurses first and foremost because nurses are always thinking about their patients. So who's thinking about nurses? My job is to think about nurses first. And if I take care of my nurses and I do right by my nurses, they're going to deliver quality care in whatever setting that they, they are in. Whether they're in an educational setting, a home health setting, a clinic, or an acute care setting, they're going to deliver quality care. So we're going to work for to improve the health standards. We're going to foster high standards of nursing. We're going to stimulate and promote the professional development of nurses. And part of that is helping them grow in the advocacy room. Come on in and sit down. Join us. So, you know, we have a social policy statement. I don't know how, how many of you have seen a social policy statement. Some of you in the academia should have seen it. But we have foundational um, documents called the Code of Ethics. Uh, social policy statement. And the reason we engage in some of these activities is because the social policy statement has a link between nursing's moral foundation and social political activism. 
Now, social political activism means getting engaged in what's happening out there. How many of you kind of engage in the political process? Couple. All right, well, I'll ask you, this, this is an election year, right? And we're going to vote for a bunch of people, right? Right? Yeah, we are, right? So how many of you voted in the last election? All right, so good. How many of you are registered to vote in this election? All right, good. I'm talking to a great group. Okay, so I'm glad. I'm glad. All right, we're ahead of the curve. Okay, you're ahead of that. That's a hundred percent participation rate. I mean, how good is that? Okay, so we feel that it is a moral obligation and part of the code of ethics to really become involved in in changing the scope of nursing practice and healthcare in the broader league arena. And part of that is through the policy making process. I don't know how many of you are aware of the policy making process. But it is about, you know, allocating resources, you know, whether it means funding for nursing programs, funding for the clinic down the block, advocating for reimbursement for advanced practice nurses, making sure that quality is a piece that's integrated in the healthcare arena so that when they short staff acute care hospitals and the quality drops, we'll see that. That's part of that. We influence the decision of others. And we try to use our skills, which nurses are masterful at. You're masterful at it. Because first and foremost, don't you advocate for your patients? I'm sure Dr. Fee, she advocates for her students. So we're really good about that. So it's just taking that skill set and moving it into another arena that sometimes makes us a little nervous. And I have to admit that I was nervous about it when I first started, that I didn't, even though my family was very politically oriented, I was not, because I was interested in other things. And while they were fighting over politics, I was like, all right, you people follow, oh, I'm going to do this, you know. But I realized when I was in nursing that the only way to affect change was to get involved in the process. And as I started to move up in my career, my nursing career, like I didn't like what was happening in my unit. And so I said, you know, I, I couldn't change the unit internally. So what did I do? I tried to get to a unit that I could then run. So then I could promote how I wanted nursing to be delivered and how I wanted my nurses treated within that unit. And once I got that kind of fever, I don't know, it's like a bug that I was infected with, you know, I then moved on and I worked for the state board for a while and when I saw that the state board passed rules and regulations that govern the whole practice of nursing in New York, I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, we got to be careful what we adopt here. Who's listening to what's happening at the state level? Where are the nurses? Because I know once this reg is, is adopted, they're not going to be happy. And so working with the state association to try and make sure that whatever was passed at that state level really reflected nursing's input. I got the fever. I got the bug. And so that moved me into the federal level where change affects not only one state, but the country. And so I got the fever bad. Bad. And I've been there for 18 years now. So there are different approaches to creating change. Um, and, and really advocating for um, the things you want to advance. So we can approach creating some voluntary programs. We can, you know, how many of you paid attention to that Supreme Court decision? Oh, amazing. Yeah, amazing. Uh, amazing. Amazing. What did you think? Shocked because of the prior decisions with things like corporations and, and well, Citizens United and Citizens stuff like that. United was a disaster. So I was shocked when Roberts. Uh, yeah. Well, I think he's a real constitutionalist, and I think he followed. He was, that was more important to uphold the Supreme Court, the entity of the Supreme Court. And so, although I was amazed by his decision, it, it didn't completely shock me because I think there have been so many people around the country feeling that the Supreme Court was becoming uh, run by political parties and not its own, you know, not following what it should be, that I think he did what he should have done. Yeah. <laughs> what others? Do you think that was a decent decision? Well, he, he, 
he certainly had to manipulate with taxes, fees, what are we going to call them, and, and you know, how to define things. So, um, exactly. That's his, his there was some thought that they were concerned that if Roberts had ruled this down, that it was really saying that the Supreme Court had succumbed to political influence. There was other thoughts out there that said he wanted to be the, the, the final say on the decision. He wanted to go down on the record with this decision. Well, but I think that's what he, he stood for following the letter of, of the Constitution, what the Constitution, you know, our founders, what they wrote. And that was, that was his idealism, I guess. Right. So I think even though he maybe wanted the final say, I don't really, I think that he really saw that something needed to be done that the Supreme Court had to take back its, its, its role. Its role in making I, this I understand there was a lot of dissension with Scalia and, and all behind closed doors and some of that has, right. has come out. So it, it, was, it really was monumental. Oh yeah, it was it was huge. It was a huge bill. How many people had that? We were in Washington at the time. We went to um, Washington last year and um, went to the conference. And um, from what we were hearing, the first thing we heard was nobody hears anything from the Supreme Court. You know, when they're, when they're debating on something, it doesn't come out at all. Right. So we didn't know what to think after listening to all those politicians and all those um, representatives. We didn't know what to think. So I was surprised and I was happy. Oh yeah. Right. yeah. So, I think a lot, a lot of us were relieved. So, um, so we talked about judicial decisions, you know, impacting policy. Certainly, we all know the legislative process governs a lot of policies. But what happens after that is really regulation and how that law is implemented and what was the intent of the law. So I just love this model, if you could see it at all. <laughs> and this model is a public policy uh, making process. I wish. Uh, provided this in my doctoral program. It's a law just model and it explains everything that happens to us. You know, for me I can directly relate to this because I'm in the policy making arena, I work in the legislative arena, and this is exactly what happens. And if you look up here with the, this window, you know you don't get windows all the time. Windows of opportunity that really can make a difference. And I would say that healthcare reform was that window. We had that window open maybe 15 years earlier. I don't know if you remember yes. the debacle yes. with Hillary in the yep. yes. Oh. Yes. And healthcare reform. Yeah. And, yeah. Not that, that really shut everything down. We couldn't move beyond that. And I will tell you that, you know, the great uh, Ted Kennedy, when he was alive, kept moving that, always trying to find yeah. this opportunity to but it seemed like the dynamics of political circumstances, the possible solutions, the agenda, those, the, the demand from the outside of people coalescing, you know, to try to make that change. And I will tell you that the one thing I ha have learned in, my, in the process, certainly you need a window of opportunity to create the change. And sometimes those windows open up and you kind of run through them really quickly. And that was the run through health care reform. And though people said it was done in the dark, it was not. It was the most open, visible process that ever occurred. Because if you were a junkie, you could have been watching it 24-7. <laughs> I mean, there are times in our offices we had C-SPAN on watching how the um, amendments came up to respond to the amendments within that law. So, but I will also tell you that just as a policy is created and legislation is, pa is passed, it can always be amended, it can always be rescinded if another opportunity opens up. I just I was really struck by the corollary between what we're doing in politics and what we do every day in our own organizations. Um, just thinking about here, we have been thinking about a doctoral program for a long time but the window of opportunity opened up and then we were able to do it. We had the back end of administration and things like that. And in, in healthcare organizations everywhere, you have to develop policy. So it's not really something foreign to what we do to every day. Exactly. And yeah. once you recognize that there is this kind of process and you can step back. I mean, part of it is so many times we're 
in the middle of it. We're immersed in it and we can't see it because we're so in the weeds. But if you step back and you look up, oh, exactly. that's what's happening yes. here. Yes. Okay, how can I be part of that is the question I always ask. How can I, or how can I influence that? But it's, this is a great model. I really love this model. I use this all the time. And I think it helps me as I look at everything. And I know that nothing stays static. Because when the 112th Congress came into play, the first thing out of the mouths of many of the Republican uh, individuals who were elected who ran on this, uh, this platform was to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the goal was, is there a window of opportunity for them to work on that and repeal it? So when I talk about advocacy, which is what I do 24-7, is, you know, what, how do we do it? What, what is effective advocacy? Again, you got to know the, the policy makers and the, and the policy, right, and the process. So just like in an institution, when a rule's coming down or somebody's changing something in a system, who, who are the people involved? Who's working it? What do you need to know and how can I, I usually know, how can I get to them? That's my usual, how can I get to them? Is there clarity on the issue? You know, I think in the debates, what, what was the, what's the big thing that they were trying to do? Obama was trying to nail Romney to say, you have never come out with specifics, yeah. right? right? And Romney was saying, <coughs> I have the specifics tonight. I'm bringing you these specifics today. I'm here. And those things that you thought I said were not said. <laughs> <laughs> they were true, no longer valid, because I have these specifics. So you have to have clarity on an issue. But then he still didn't give the specifics, but right. he was going to bring it to the Congress, and there would be discussion with the Congress. Oh, so so we have to do that today. Everybody heard him speak live from Virginia. <laughs> well, he was better. He, he did better in Virginia. He has, he's really good with the crowd, and they're saying that, you know, I'm glad we're going back and forth because this is exciting. So anyway, they're saying Romney is a businessman. So what does a businessman do? You build, you sell things, sell things, and you build your case. Mm -hmm. Right? You got to sell it. And my son's a salesperson, and the reality is, as a lobbyist, I'm a salesperson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I yeah. sell ideas to Congress. Right. I make them want. I show them why it's important for them to move on my issue. So Romney's a businessman. He has to come in with his proposal, his platform, and he was. Romney, the businessman, at that debate. Obama comes from a professorial type of environment. He's an educator at times. He's, he likes to lecture, you know. And when you, he's lecturing, not always debating. Maybe he does debate. I don't know if he was a litigator. I don't think he was a litigator. Because if you're a litigator, then you can go take that. So that is not his comfort zone. So he's in a zone that he's not comfortable. And he's been, for the last three and a half years, been deferred to because he is the president and he's been kind of sheltered. So he is not, somebody does not, listen, buddy, this is not what I said. Nobody comes up to the president like that. It's like Mr. President. You know, so that that's a little bit, you know, off-putting for him. And maybe he had to, you know, kind of refigure himself again, try to figure out how do I respond to that. But... Anyway, as we move on, we'll, we'll touch back on that. So planning with realistic expectations, and then the legislative process, what did I say? 15 years ago, we were working on health care reform. And then people said, oh, we rushed it through. Give me a <laughs> break. <laughs> Give me a <laughs> Teddy <laughs> Roosevelt. I the very proposal. Since the 30s. Yes, homo. I mean, really, people. Tune in tonight. Tune in to the world. It's not a new concept. That's right. <laughs> so... Um, we know it is an uphill battle. It's always an uphill battle. It's a struggle. And, you know, why well, hate when people ask me, so what are your goals for the coming year? How many bills do you think you're going to get passed into law? Don't tell me that. I'm not, I don't have any magic ball. I don't have that little super eight ball that I don't know this is all going to happen. I don't know. People change. We are going to change again in Congress, right? We have elections coming up. 435 people are running for office on the House side. We have another 33 people running on the Senate side. We have to change the balance. And, you know, I keep saying that when you start a Congress and the minority leader says, our job here, the Republican side on the Senate says, Mitch McConnell, 
My goal is to make sure that this president is not successful. What about that did the country not hear? What about that? The interesting thing on uh, the, the Republican side is that for the first time, they did not walk lockstep together. They had dissension among the ranks. Now, the Democrats always have yeah. dissension among the ranks, right? Because we're a very diverse group. Well, the Republicans, how many of you, I'm dating myself, but it's okay. It's, it's wisdom and experience. You know? <laughs> seasoned, I'm seasoned, okay? You know, spicy now. So, um, uh, you know, they had the contract with America in 1990. Newt Gingrich. Remember, he was running in the Republican primary. Remember, oh, God, thank God we don't have Newt. You know, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. That can go somewhere else. But anyway, so we had Newt, and he had the contract with America. All those Republicans stood on and said, this is what we're going to do. And we, they worked. Lock, when they had a vote, they were all required to vote. That is not today's Congress. Because who came in there? Who came into this Congress, the, the 112 Congress that came out that said, we're going to change and we're not going to spend, we're going to cut the deficit, I'm not going to bankrupt my children anymore. They kind of drink a little beverage. Yeah, tea party. Tea party. That's right. We're close to Boston, right? So um, the Tea Party came in. The Tea Party came in. We're not cutting, we're not doing anything. And they are the party of no. No internally and no externally. No, no, no. So Boehner, who's on the House side, has no control over his troops. And now the troops, for the first time, are fighting with each other. Yeah. Because on the left side, they were the liberals and the super liberals, right? Now we got issues on the R side. And they're like, oh. So they can't control the vote. Remember, there was a vote that on the debt, it was, it was it the sequester or the debt ceiling? I don't know. They all merged together. but. Boehner went in and had a deal, cut the deal with the Senate, That's right. right? And it didn't. And it didn't go. And then he said, "Oh, I, then he backed away. I didn't cut the deal with them." Jim well, Bachman and all of that group, who the Tea Party who people. Lost. Yeah. So all that comes to play. So I can't control the variables of who gets elected, and I can't control who they are and what they do when they get there. And we all know now that the parties are extremely diverse, and that's impacting. What actually gets through in Congress? But don't you think the Tea Party, unfortunately, had been somewhat successful up until fairly recently with making a lot of the moderate Republicans move to the right because they were afraid of, of re-election in their district? You know, what I see, I think that the moderate Republicans are not running. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the moderate Republicans lost the last time. Yeah, yeah because of that. So now we have... Conservative, and I'll take the liberty of saying, and nut jobs. <laughs> this is a, this is you know I know it's taped for posterity, so it's fun. <laughs> whatever. They some of them are so they are not reasonable. They are not there to negotiate. They are not mm -hmm. there to compromise. They are one issue people, and they are not. The, the thought of Congress was people come with different positions and different policies and you get together and you start to talk mm -hmm. and you start to find some middle ground. There is no middle ground. There's only my way or the highway. And when you have a body like that, you cannot enact a law or get something through a process if people aren't willing to negotiate and that. compromise because they used to say in our shop it, it is if nobody's happy with the law then it's a good law because somebody everybody has to give something um but that's not happening do you think now when it's talking about the nuts oh, i'm sorry i didn't mean to, I, no, I, but I, I, some I, of them are but, really out there but do you think that a lot of those nuts are a mixture of both your neocons and your evangelicals and that something's got to break up there in, in that uh, well, they they function on the under the rubric of you know very conservative financial you know even though they are they have other policy issues that they're worried about their their goal really right now is really focused on cutting down the debt and 
And so mm -hmm. anything that has to do with money, you could almost it's almost impossible to talk about with Congress. Mm -hmm. And so there is no middle ground. They kind of they're walking locks up together mm -hmm. on that on that point. But in the other areas, they give and take. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that's really struck me about the presidential election is I think people forget that the president can't get anything done without the Congress. Mm -hmm. And the presidential election really takes away from looking at the other candidates to see, like you said, who's the nut jobs. <laughs> and, um, you know, and the presidential candidates promise you the moon, and they can't deliver because of all this dissent in Congress. So um, how do you get people to focus on that and to see people as you know, not one, you know, one issue uh, candidates, but the, the entirety of their, their um, yeah, because, record. Because yeah. really the reality is that when these individuals get elected to office, they are supposed to represent the wishes and the needs of their district. Yeah. And if it's the Senate, of their state. That's why mm -hmm. it takes so long, because you have a broad constituency on the state level, so when you're doing with a district, are these people really representing their districts or are they re representing just their own ideology? Mm. And that's, you know, some of them, you know, I, I think that um, Ted Stevens was beloved at times, Republican Alaska who died in a plane mm -hmm. crash mm -hmm. because he would bring money, just like Senator Anaway in Appropriations brings money to the state, right? These people will turn down federal dollars that come to their needy districts to prove a point. Are they serving their their own ideology, or are they say, serving the needs of their constituents? Many of them, and I, you know, I, I use the nut job loosely, but some of them are out there. Some of them are really such. They're so out of tune with really what needs to happen on a federal level and so immersed in their own ideology that they can't be reasonable. And that's why I use the term Alan nut West. Right. Huh? Alan West. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I think, you know, I think it becomes a challenge. And I, I don't want uh, you to walk away with I'm labeling all Democrats <laughs> is good and Republicans is bad. That is not. Because you need both parties to bring those different opinions to the table, those different perspectives to negotiate, to compromise, to come out with good policy that will impact the lives of people in this country. But that isn't happening. But it does take a long time. It is not easy. And some of these issues are related to timing. Remember the window of opportunity. Relationships. How do people get along with each other? And how much money is out there? What kind of resources? So when you look at issues, is the issue that you're thinking about moving, is it relevant to other people? I mean, I always look at that. Is it relevant to the constituent I'm talking to, the member I'm talking to? Is it relevant to his or her constituents? Is there a history? If we look at the health care reform bill, there was a history. I mean, we've done the Health Privacy Act. We've tried to get um, do this insurance issue before. We've tried this several times, and we keep trying it and trying it until the window opens and, and we flood through it. And when there's the political will, then more things are likely to happen. What does a power base look like? These principles can be adopted in your own setting. The university here, the college here, the, the hospital, the home care agency, whatever. All these factors can be used to assess that environment. What are the relationships? <coughs> now I can tell you when we were working <laughs> on many of our issues, we had worked really hard at developing relationships with people on the right and people on the left, and we had a lot of moderates too. Whether they're conservative Democrats or moderate Republicans, you had to work with everybody. Our job is to meet with everybody, to work with everybody, talk to everybody. But it's more than just legislation. I, if you heard Obama speak at the Democratic Convention, he said, I didn't make this happen. I, don't know, I remember this, these words. I didn't make this happen. I didn't make health care reform happen. You did. The people made it happen. Because there was a huge amount of engagement around this issue. Many groups had coalesced to really move this issue. 
people were engaged. People liked it or didn't like it. I don't know what you saw in this community. What did you see in this community when we were talking about health care? Do you remember any of those conversations? Did, was anybody engaged or in which community? When we were here in this community, um, in the state, how were people engaged about health care reform? We had a, a big um, open to the community here debate about it between nursing and the business department. It was fabulous. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How did it go? Nursing one. <laughs> Nursing one? <coughs> Nursing yep. came prepared okay. with specifics. Business came with a microphone thinking that just tell everybody you can't, you can't do it because it'll cost too much. It'll cost too much. And I love when I get asked the question, Show me in the Constitution, which I always carry. Show me in the Constitution where it says health care. And I point to protect the general welfare. And then I give them the Constitution. I say, show me where it says corporation. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. Okay. We had a lot of um, sta uh, stakeholders involved. And what are the relationships with the policymakers? And you know I already told you about the environment. And I will tell you, if I think back to health care reform, 2000, I think it was 2009, end of 2009, um, Senator Kennedy passed away. Mm -hmm. Changed yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. Am I okay? You're Cha fine. Okay, changed everything. And I will tell you why. Yeah. Certainly, he, he was always carrying this. For him... This was something he really believed in. He wanted to get done. He tried it. I remember standing out in the winter with signs behind Senator Kennedy on another rally related to health care. Always. You know, he called. We are there. Nurses are there. There was hope that typically when a bill is moving through Congress, some, you, you have a House bill sometimes, then we have a Senate bill. And what happens when those bills are different? They, they have, have to be conference. Side side. Side. They have to be side by side. People have to what? Mm -hmm. Negotiate yeah. what stays in what bill, and they come out with a grand bill. When Kennedy passed away, it was difficult to get the bill out of the Senate. It was the problem. And it was a problem then, you know, because Scott, Scott Brown, the model, centerfold Scott Brown, got elected to office, and he's in a very difficult, i got to put some, fun in here. Um, <laughs> you know, Mr. GQ um, got elected into office. He's he's running against Elizabeth Warren now, and they have a hot debate, and she's, you know, they're debating over whether she's part Cherokee or not. Um, and so, um, you got to love some of this stuff. It's very, you know, you got to watch this. But he was so condescending when he said, look at her. Look at her. She looks <laughs> like she's a Cherokee. Uh, uh, Hello. Uh, Hello. All right. So, um, <laughs> It is kind of condescending, but um, so anyway, we could we knew once that bill had gone through the Senate, it was a miracle that it had gone through the Senate already. There was no way if it was going to get revised that it was going to have another opportunity to get through the Senate. So it was up to the House really to adopt the Senate bill. So there was no real negotiation. Then there was another bill passed after that, but to make some other changes. But it was really hard. And part, part of it was because there was no relationship or limited relationships between the policymakers. There was a lot of angst and um, really, you know, hate for each other. And a lot of them didn't want to do it. And I will tell you from meeting with many of the members' offices, you know, we had a whole group of people there who really were talking about single payer. Do you remember the single payer discussion? And then we had a public plan. There was oh, a single, single payer, single payer. Yeah. and then yeah. we first it started out. So in the single, policy, yeah. we believe in single payer, but we also believe in incremental reform. And let me yeah. tell you, I had a hard time getting people to say, stop saying single payer. But some people on the real extreme left said, really attack some of those Democratic lawmakers because they gave up on the single payer. It's you sold good. us out. Mm -hmm. How did that work with their relationships? So they stepped out of the game. Our role in that was to say, I'm not stepping away from this game. This is the closest that we have ever come to moving an issue, right? So I need to be in the game. Mm -hmm. And I can't negotiate anything if I'm not in the game. 
So we kept working through the process to make sure that nursing's perspectives were seen in the bill. But it was clear that it was hard to move this issue. It was getting hard. As time went by, and after Senator Kennedy passed away, it was harder and harder. Really hard. So we all know it takes a lot of people power, and I will tell you that the country was totally engaged. When I look at how many emails we sent out and how many things we got back from nurses, it was the most engaged I've ever seen our nurses. I did get a lot of hate mail. People, a lot of nurses don't believe health care is a right, more that everybody should pay their own way, but I don't know why they don't like the mandate because it makes everybody pay a certain way, but we had a lot of hate mail. But I had a lot of nurses engaged about, yes, we're doing the right thing, really moving it forward, really giving us the incentive. You know, I think we had at least 10 for every one, you know, and we're used to that. We also needed money to move this. And, you know, money was a big piece of how they showed that the bill would kind of start to cut down the cost of health care. I mean, really, they had to demonstrate that within the bill. It takes a lot of resources. And it took a lot of physical and, and financial resources on the outside to try to move the bill because everybody was engaged. You have a lot of ads running. People had to know what the facts were, and we, we needed them to really push their members because, you know, once you elect them to office, can you vote for them? I mean, can you vote in Congress? Do you vote in Congress? Oh, no. No, no. no. You don't right? You, you, have, you, have, to vote, right? you have to keep talking to them. <laughs> That's right. You have to keep emailing them. You have to keep... Right. You, you have you know, to hold them accountable. Yeah. You and you have to let them know what you value and what you believe. So once they're in there, bye-bye. Yeah, you know, they're, they're sitting at the table. I read somewhere that they count for every you know, a piece of information they get, like a letter. They figure there's about 200 other people that think the same way. Right. Is that about what they do? Yeah, I, I mean, they think they think that for other, one letter is, is huge. They tally those, and then they multiply them because yeah. they know that they're, you know, think about yourselves. How many times do you send a positive remark to a hotel or someplace where you, it's really been a good stay? But doggone it, if it was nasty, you're going to let them know, right? <laughs> You know, we're all guilty of that. We're all guilty of really focusing on the negative rather than on the positive. That's why customer service now is such a big deal. You do like your stay. Come back. But, but you know, in Congress, if you, if you, right? you have to wait. Huh? In Congress, you have to wait. You have to wait. A couple of years until Before you Before you vote them out. So they're yeah. there. You made a, so your district made a bad choice. <laughs> oh, and you've got to pay the price. So what's the best you could do? What's the best you could do? Complain. Yeah. Hey, I don't like this. You know what? I really yeah. want you to vote this way on this issue. And and force their hand. I mean, we had some people that we actually endorse candidates, so we take interviews and stuff. And that one person we interviewed said he was going to help us on a bill he'd support. And when he came in, he wasn't supporting us. So we took the little <laughs> the questionnaire and we said, you know, by the way, let me just tell you that your boss, because you talked to their staff, your boss said the following, they were going to support us on this, and you know what? They had it. This was a promise you didn't keep. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure our nurses are going to be happy with that, and we're going to let them know. And so um, he changed his mind quickly. So, um, but, you know, I mean, you have to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And then you have to let them know. that You just can't assume that they're going to do the right thing. We know advocacy works because we know this whole list of bills that we have passed into law. The bill that took the shortest amount of time, that was 1999. And I know the passage of the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act. I don't know how many of you use uh, retractable syringes or needleless devices in the yeah. field. That was an account of us, SEIU. The hospitals came to the table and said it's too expensive. Yeah. Yep. There was a re uh, Republican who was the chair of the, of the committee that held the hearing. Karen Daly, who's our current president, had had a needle stick injury and had become HIV positive, a hep C positive, and mm -hmm. lost her job. She was an ER nurse. Mm -hmm. It was an accident. She was getting rid disposing of syringe, oh. and she went to put it, got a deep puncture wound, <laughs> and she couldn't work anymore in the ER. And so he heard the story, and we brought an eco we we brought a. Uh, an economic case. Economic, we brought the economic value to the table. The, we brought the business case. We said, for every one nurse we lose, this is the cost. This is the cost. And you mean to tell me this cent, you know, was like additional cent per syringe. And I know we use a lot of syringes, but 
could impact, you know, how we do workers' compensation and how nurses would lose their jobs if, or the reduction of lost jobs for nursing, not only nursing, healthcare workers in general, because it was more than just nursing mm -hmm. using the syringes. That bill took a year. But then eventually it should have decreased the cost because then no one would be using the ones that weren't safety. So then the manufacturers would have had to um, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, you know, balance, it, rebalance balance out it, the, and the cost. cost. So yeah. eventually it would go down because that, that's the only game in town. Right, right. So, you, you know, you, you can make a case. So you have to make the projected cost and right. the change in the projected cost. And, you know, right. we were just, you know, nurses. I will tell you, it's been a long journey because we just believe that you should do things because it's right. Yes, we do. <laughs> Yeah. And we think everybody else good of all. Yeah. yeah, and and you know, and it's been a hard, it's been a hard lesson that we had to come up with a business case. Mm -hmm. Once we started to come up with a business case, we started to hear more people listen to us mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, well, all right, so we'll consider that, whether they're Republican or Democrat." Oh, okay, I understand that now. So I almost fell off my chair when I was in that hearing, and that Republican. Um, chair of that committee said to the hospital, why aren't you doing this? He says, I want this moved out of committee as soon as possible, and I want it moved over to the Senate. <coughs> I think that um, Lobby Day is the most amazing day yes. for students to be involved in, and I love the way the ANA gets up there and talks about all policies that are out there. What do we need to talk about? The students come out of there so ready to fight. They're ready. They come back and they talk to everybody, you know, what they saw. The year we were down there, they were talking about how um, they wanted to make it a felony, you know, to attack a nurse. A nurse right. <laughs> right. The students were floored when they heard that it was a felony if you attack a fireman or a police right. officer. Okay, yes, it should be. But a bus driver? But it wasn't a felony for a nurse, you know, so mm -hmm. they were shocked. Yeah. And, um, it's just, like I said, such a wonderful opportunity. I wish more people would be involved and promote it and encourage students to go. I, I really think we have to, because we get them young, and then we started something. Right, because they remember those experiences, and they know they can make a difference. Because part of it is you feel you like mm -hmm. somebody, you can't make any more difference. Mm -hmm. It's it. But it is about a relationship. It is about creating change, voicing your opinion, getting involved. And you don't have to go to the Capitol all the time. You can do it in your pajamas at night. I just want to ask before you. Oh, oh before I'm sorry. You, go ahead. Uh, did, were you also involved with the nursery reinvestment act? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, we didn't. I don't think I put that there, but you know, the um, 2010 Affordable Care Act reauthorized the nursery reinvestment act, and the nursery reinvestment act. That's a good little story too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we're good. So the nursery reinvestment act is a good story because it. Um, we were stalled on the House and the Senate side, and. I was trying to figure out a way to get it back on the radar screen because even though it's a good policy, you know, it wasn't it wasn't one of those major critical policies, but it was reauthorizing all these nursing programs and funding and scholarships right. and stuff like that. So we worked actually with Johnson and Johnson, who gave us a first aid kit, and we put first aid for the Nursery Investment Act, and we got Barbara Mikulski, and we had a press conference, and John Dingle. We had a press conference and we said we want to get the bill passed into law. We were on the Capitol steps and we had a press conference and we got momentum. We got the bill which was stuck in the House. We got it pushed out and then back on the Senate side and we got them to pass it and it was signed into law on the Bush administration. And so the two nurses who went to that were the president of ANA and the president of AACN went to the bill signing at um, in the Oval Office that time for the Nursery Investment Act. But that was a provision I, you know, I certainly worked on that bill very closely. But, um, you know, it was another bill. Oops. So, and we certainly, we worked really dog hard on this. I thought I was going to lose my life on this one. It was <laughs> relentless. <laughs> I did get more gray hair. I even lost it. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, it was... <coughs> I will tell you that we were so committed, and I had a team that was so committed. You would think I had hundreds of people working in a house. There were two lobbyists, really. Um, and we worked all the time on this issue. And we really focused on provisions that really impacted nursing the most. Because 
so many people working on some so uh, some other positions. Some people are more expert at other position positions or provisions, and we had a lot of relationships with other stakeholders. So we could sign on, you know, to letters and really let them know that nursing supported it. But I didn't have to carry all that water. The water I was carrying was nursing's water, which we were for the first time. I am proud to say that nursing finally got its act together and work collaboratively on this bill. Something I had not seen for years. We got together, we put together a platform of what things we wanted. That platform was shared with members on the House, on the Senate side, and with the administration. And because we have the strongest relationship with the President, because we had helped to elect him, we endorsed him, we had helped to elect him in office. And if you recall, during that time frame, every time that bill got quiet, it had like an ebb and flow to it. I don't know if you remember. It would look like it was never going to happen. And then we would get a call. We'd like the nurses to come to the White House. And we did White House Rose Garden events. We did uh, a whole nurse event in the White House just on these issues. And um, every time it was going down, the nurses were called to, bring, to really revive it and bring it, put it back on the radar screen until it finally got done. And so um, our president... That day that that bill got signed into law, certainly we couldn't go to the private ceremony, which was the bill signing. Remember the bill signing? He remember how he used one pen yeah. for every like little curve? Because yeah. um, everybody wants the pen that the six the president uses to sign a bill, and this was a monumental bill. Um, but um, they had a second ceremony that was with the president for all the people who were did all the grassroots. And we were part of that team. So the president of a and sat in the first row. And, got, and by that time, he knew, at that time it was Rebecca Patton, Becky Patton, uh, came from the state of Ohio. He knew her by the name of Becky. Mm -hmm. He knew her. And he, they put her in the front row. We had a very close relationship with the White House staff. And we were able to shake the president's hand. I have a I have a video clip to end your session oh. of the Rose of the Rose Garden event with A and A. So okay. you can know if you want to close with and then turn it over to me, I will show that. Okay. So I'm not gonna go through all the provisions. There are some provisions, you know, we're talking about I, I would say that the Affordable Care Act also did a lot for nursing. I know we talk about eliminating pre-existing conditions, lifetime limits, and bringing your child who's under uh, 26 under. But I would say that in the Affordable Care Act, we did a lot to move health care from the medical model into wellness and prevention. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And the mantra with nursing, with a and has always been more community-based. So you'll see nurse-managed clinics, school-based clinics. We have more funding coming from the uh, graduate uh, medical you know, GME, graduate medical education for physicians, gets about $9 billion. What we get through Title VIII is about $231 million. What we were able to get in this bill is a carve-out from Medicare for graduate nurse education for preparation of nurse practitioners. Okay. Um, and that was $200 million over four years. So This seems to dovetail so well with the IOM future of yes. nursing. Like yes. They just really come together. Well, you, you know, in some respects, and I'm going to speak from an ANA perspective, we've been doing what the IOM has written for years, trying to get nurses into positions of power, trying to make sure that we're, we're providers recognized at the highest level. I mean, I was there with Balanced Budget Act 97, BBA 97, which recognized direct reimbursement for nurse practitioners at 85%. Nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, I, I mean, so we've been moving in that direction, but I think the fact that we all got together, it has some, this Affordable Care Act has anti-discrimination language for providers that AMA hates, because mm -hmm. it means you can't discriminate against the provider. Mm -hmm. It's like an any willing provider. You have to recognize the provider for the roles, uh, the licensure, their ability to practice in the full scope of their licensure and not defer to one or the other. So. It moved us in a great direction, and a lot of that was us working with the White House, working with administration, working with members of Congress, who we already, what did I say at the beginning? We had to have relationships with. 
right? So, um, <laughs> you know, if it was easy, all of this could have been done overnight, but it's not. It's very hard. And so we know you have to have these variables. You need to have your knowledge. You have to be credible. I will never lie to a legislator. I will never fabricate the truth. I just wanted to say, I thought... It was very interesting because I was in Washington in June uh -huh. um, for the, oh no, in August, for the coalition, the breastfeeding coalition, okay. the New York statewide breastfeeding coalition, and we had, went for advocacy. And it was so interesting to me how actually how easy it was to talk to, the, to your legislators. Right. I thought it was hard. It's not. You call them up, they make an appointment, you walk in, you tell them, I want to talk about A, B, C, and D. They say, okay. And then and they ask you and you have a conversation with them. They're very civil. They're actually engaging. They want to know what you want to talk about. And it, it was such an eye-opening experience for me. Because I thought, oh, no, can't do that. Well, you know, about can't walk in there. Right. You know, oh, you know. But then I went back and said, this is mine. I pay for this. That's right. You know, this is my country. Right. And why am I afraid they're representing me. Exactly. And I need to go in there and say, I want you to support this. Right. And these are the reasons why. And give me the money for it. Right. <laughs> Show me the money. You know? And it was, it was so empowering. It, it's very and, it, and The process is really not, I mean, I know it takes a long time to get something through, but that process of advocating and going for your legislation is easy. It's easy. And as a nurse, they respect you. Because you come with a lot of knowledge yes. and, and a lot of negotiation because you do that every day right. in your practice. And so you can put your points across to them mm -hmm. and it's not that scary. No, it's not. And, and tell I, me and about I the think a lot of nurses think that it is. And it's not. You know? mm -hmm. And it's not. Tell me about the individuals you met with. Are they um, seasoned like me or mm -hmm. are they... Um... No, they're very young. Yeah, that's right. They're, 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 they're like in their early... I'm going to say maybe late 20s, Yeah. all right, and, and they come to the table like with the respect for you. Yeah. You know, you, you walk in there, and they, it's not like, yeah, I'm the boss of you. No, no, it's you're a constituent of me, of mine, and I would like to know what you have to say, and I'm going to take that to my boss, mm -hmm. and I'm going to take that there. It was eye-opening to me. It was great. And great, wonderful experience. Yeah, I think, you know, I accompanied the students on Mother Day on several occasions. And one of the occasions that I was there, I happened to have a student in my group who was a second degree student, had a first degree with political science. Oh. And her approach was so much different than, than any of the other students. So I think it's an empowerment. Yes. And, and just, mm -hmm. we may not give them enough of that as students. This student mm -hmm. was clearly really different. Yeah. She really was, not only that she knew, but she did her home, but she also was comfortable. You know, which I, you know, when I compared her to the rest of the students, she was more or less at the same level in terms of nursing, but had this previous background. And, say, where, where is the background in nursing in the legislative process? Right. I, I, I didn't get any. We, we need more. We, we I, I mean, I didn't any. get any when yeah. I was, you know, coming up and I, I've been, I, I tell you, I've been in school all my life. <laughs> so it's, it's what it seems like anyway. So, yeah, I mean, you know, like, through, through different processes. Yeah. Uh, and I, I didn't get that. It wasn't a priority. Right. So that maybe, maybe that's us. where we, you know, we, we need we to say we are a powerful group. I and, think that more doctoral programs get exposed to policy oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, the DMP has a health in the, policy. In the no, graduate it, program, I, the, I teach yeah. the issues, which has a whole political section in it. And it's that I actually do it for three weeks, all about uh, similar to what you're doing here. But I have found it disheartening in the last couple of years where my graduate students, my master's students, when I ask them, First of all, they don't know the difference between state and federal, yeah. but they don't know they who don't. their okay. they don't know who their federal senators right. are, and that's a graduate student. It's very disheartening. But it can be amusing. I had one of my students told me that her senator was John Gotti, which is well, <laughs> pretty funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, 
I said, I think you're thinking of somebody else who was in the news. <laughs> but um, it, it, I find it very disheartening when I have people who hold professional licenses, and we know that there are so many of these issues when we vote that we should be aware of, and they don't even know who, who their federal senator is. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. You know, you, you brought up in the news, and I was wondering if, uh, you know, I ask my students, okay, does anybody read a newspaper? No. no. Does anybody listen to the radio or the TV for their news anymore? No. And I'm like, well, where do you get your news? And they're so focused on their daily life of, you know, getting through school and that, and that they really don't have their radar out for the bigger issues. Right. Um, and, and that probably continues after we get out of school and get involved in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we complain a lot, but we don't realize we may have an influence that we do have that opportunity. So, uh, and, and nursing have, has a lot of credibility. Yeah. We, we know how to communicate because we do that on a regular basis. We have to expend the energy. Sometimes we don't have the energy <laughs> to expend. That's the problem. We have to, when you go into these meetings, you have to be willing to listen as well as to um, speak. But And you have to be willing to negotiate. Maybe it's not the perfect thing and you, you know, but you have to be willing to give a little bit so you have a partnership and you have to work with other people because you don't work with other people. Some other people may come in the next meeting after you and say, that's a stupid bell. Who was she talking about? We don't, we're not interested and we're in charge of breastfeeding in the United States, you know. And so unless you kind of get some understanding of where your opponents are or if you start to, they could shoot you. It doesn't take much to kill a bill, believe me. It doesn't take much, but it's hard to move it forward. And you have to see if you have any financial support or what kind of resources you have and what kind of a constituency. The issue with healthcare reform is that the whole world, you know, our country was involved. There were many constituencies who had been waiting for this moment and were totally engaged. And there were people really providing grants and financing to really educate people. And so it became monumental to move it, you know. I agree with what you said before you just uh, made this comment. Because I remember when we went to Washington, it, was, it wasn't last year, it was June this year. And that's when we met you. And we think they're doing a, a great job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, but thanks to Fig and the, the program for uh, giving, giving us that um, opportunity to take us to Washington. Mm -hmm. I thought I was close to heaven. I was like, this is great. <laughs> this is great. And walking into the offices of the of the um, of the um, state men and the, the council men and the representatives and all these people, and like um, you just said, it's very easy to go there. But one thing that I learned and I came away with was when uh, we, we all went with all uh, different um, different um, requests. Yes. But then when we got there and we met with, um, I forgot who we met with, but we had a meeting with the Fafig and she suggested, and that really nailed it home to, to me, that we all have to come with one voice. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. some of our problems are also uh, stem from the fact that we all come with different voices. Mm -hmm. And like you said, she can go in and say something. Somebody else can come in and say, I'm the president of the Breastfeeding Association in, in America, so that was a stupid idea. Mm -hmm. so it's always good to collaborate with other people right. and to communicate with other people and come in with one voice. <laughs> we came in with the title eight. We right. changed everything that we, we all brought, and we said that we came in with title eight, right. and we worked together with that. And I was one of the people who went into a representative's office and spoke about the title eight, and they listened. And they listened, and they listened. Yeah, yeah. it was all with one voice. Exactly, because not, it's easy for a legislator to say, if you all can't agree, come back some other time when you get it yeah. all together, because I'm not here. But they're not going to step in it. You know, mm -hmm. many, they, they don't want to step, they don't, they don't want to alienate their constituents. They don't want to be the arbitrator of the battles of your internal organization or whatever, or your profession. They want to say, is this what you'd like? We can help to advance that. What was really good when we were doing it was four of us went in, all coming from all different perspectives. So I was coming from the nursing perspective. We had a physician with us. We had a, a community um, advocate, advocacy person, and we had a mother. Oh. All right. So it was, it was a, 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 you know, each of us could speak to a different part. Right. And, and it was, I mean, it was one of the best days of my life, honest to God. <laughs> wow. It really was. It, it, it was that empowering. It's, it's very empowering. It's just, and, and once you do it, you're like, oh, why did I build up that barrier, that wall so high when 
you know, I had my act together, we went in, and you felt great about it. You felt yeah. like I did something. I did something. And, you know, something more nurses need to learn. You get even more than what you bargained for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 20, a, about 20 years ago, I guess it was, or 25 years ago, I was doing a lot of lobbying with the New York State Nurses Association. And um, we had somebody from here, he's, he's died since then, but some of you might remember his name, Tully, Mike, Mike Tully from yeah. here. And he was the state senator. And after I had lobbied with him a couple of times on a couple of different bills, he asked me if I would be his informant on health care issues, that anything that came to him, if he needed an explanation, would I consult with him on the bill? So I, I guess for about five or six years until he got sick, I was his consultant. Whenever anything came across that had health ramifications to it, that he, he would ask me if I'd take a look at it and what, what I thought about it. So it, it was great. I loved doing it, you know, but yeah. I, I, that wasn't even what I went in for initially. I was just... And, and, and my goal, that's a perfect example, my goal is someday mm -hmm. have a nurse who's connected with every representative and every senator so that we have on the ground, because now they're talking not to a lobbyist, but a constituent mm -hmm. who they have already developed a relationship to say, what do you think about this bill? This is going to impact health care. From a nursing perspective, what do you think? You know, and to provide, the association can provide you some resources to help you determine that because sometimes those pills are huge. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh my God. But um, that's what I think should happen. Not just health care, help. Help. Mm -hmm. Help. You no, know, help. But in terms of, of You're absolutely right. the community, in terms of education, in terms of jobs, mm -hmm. to, it, what affects health? Health, mm -hmm. yes. And, and nursing needs to be at that table. Yes, absolutely. And, and that would be so let me know if you want to sign up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever think, though, because the issue that I was really wedded to up when we went to Washington, it was you know, a wonderful experience, was mandating that the entry level would be bachelor, bachelor, bachelor and, yeah. uh, prepared nurses. But that's a state issue. Which is a state issue, So, which was lovely to bring to, you know, um, to the table for a discussion. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen based on the last statement that you make, because within the profession itself, we can't get our act together to agree to that. So that's really never going to go forward until other professional um, associations say, we support this. Right. Here in this state, we support this. And if in New York State doesn't, it does not become the first state to make that amendment, I don't really see the future of... We're not going to be first, right. but we're going to be like second or third. So, you know... <laughs> And it was like surprising know. when I brought when I had brought the bill up. That there were other colleges, doctoral uh, prepared uh, programs. They were like, "Wow, that's happening in New York because that's not happening in our state." Yeah, you know, like that's not coming to the floor years. in our state, and everyone's kind of like perked up in the room. So, do you see that happening in any other states coming to fruition? And let me. Oh, you want to show? Okay, so I will tell you that my understanding is that New York is a bit, is walking away from that. And Jersey is moving a little bit away because Jersey has been at the right. forefront. And the other group that was trying to carry that is Rhode Island, and they put it on the back burner. And, and two in the Northwest are, are starting to push it forward. But, uh, but, you know, North Dakota rescinded from it, which was horrible. Um, but I think, I think that New York is just holding on it for a while, but I think they're going to push again. You have other information than, than I do. I know, that, I know they pulled it back right now. They have the 10-year... Thing, which is also crazy, but as you said, you have to negotiate. You know, the, the you, that you have ten years after you graduate right. to get it, which is written. I, in the I think what's oh, did you? No, yeah, it was, it was interesting because I happened to be in Albany, and uh, this was one of the um, bills that we were discussing. And so in the room was, you know, they would meet with, you know, my Miller College students, Miller College students, and there was another faculty with Queensboro. Oh. Okay, which is a two-year diploma, mm -hmm. uh, two-year mm -hmm. associate's degree mm -hmm. program. So, yeah, so, you know, we were presenting a different picture between the two groups. I, I would say do not underestimate the power of associate degree schools. Oh, no. Do oh, not underestimate yeah, yeah. that. And until they're on board, that's not going to happen. What I am seeing trending in the country is that Workplaces, yes, that's institutions that's are now requiring people yes. to have a baccalaureate. So if the market dictates it, we will see a change. But I don't think nursing 
you know, I, I really don't see nursing getting together on this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see them. They cannot. We are, I mean, physical therapists now get their doctorate. I know, absolutely. Physical therapists, pharmacists, pharmacists, pharmacists are PharmDs. I mean, a lot of other professions have, um, we're not even asking for a doctorate. We're asking for a baccalaureate. <laughs> yeah. If you think yeah, that a right? teacher, a teacher needs to get with an, I think it's five years of yes. graduation, their master's. master's. We're not uh, even asking for a master's. We're asking for a baccalaureate. And so the BSN in 10 was really an opportunity to say, if you're working full time and you 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 don't have your baccalaureate, it can take you 10 years. So you could do it part time. Yeah. You can continue your job, live your life, and kind of work it in with online programs. There's a bigger likelihood that you could you could achieve that. But we can't even agree on that. So I don't know what the, what's wrong. I think one of the problem here in New York, though, too, is the big mess in New York State with the National Association. And the problems oh, right. Yeah. Well, that I think, little, I've, 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 this happened before. I, guess, I, say. Oh, I, I know it happened before. It's been up there now for, I, I hate yeah. to tell you how many years yeah. that's been up there. But, but I think that maybe they're pulling back on it because of everything that's going on. Well, mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't know. I want to say that. This is Rose Gonzalez speaking. Yeah. I don't think it's their priority. I don't think it's that group's priority. Right. Uh -huh. That's what they feel. It's not. It's and not to their mandate priority. and dictate. It yeah. should be within the it's profession not. itself. And it's a shame because the market is driving a bachelor's degree program. Um, you know, with Magnet and mm -hmm. achieving that and healthcare systems and the change of the Affordable Care Act and networks changing and taking over other hospitals. Right. That, you know, again, an outside industry is dictating to, to nurses Absolutely. to come together and say, this is the standard. I mean, I've gone to other conferences where uh, there is a high level of associate degree nurses, like in the Midwest, and I didn't realize that because you live in your own environment. Right. You, know, you know, and there's a need because they don't have access to a bachelor's program. Right. Or, you know. Pennsylvania so, still has a ton of diploma schools. I, 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 I used to. <laughs> and you don't realize yeah. that these schools still mm -hmm. exist, diploma schools, associate There's degree schools. So you don't know, even in the profession, you don't know what yeah. is in the country as far as education. And, and I would think if hospitals had it their way, they would like to go back to diploma yeah. programs. Yeah. 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 Maybe they yeah. might yeah. it. Medical, yeah, some of them. Yeah. Here, but yeah. North Shore, I think, you know, they don't take anymore, I think. They don't hire. Yeah, and also, so North Shore, they don't hire anymore. Yeah. You know, they need to have... If Hospitals have their way. They like to go to institutional license. Well, oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Good dialogue. So, so here we have, this is us celebrating the fact that, you know, we did make it happen. Healthcare reform was a reality. And yes, we did. This is the president at our AMA meeting. Um, so, what you have just pointed out here is there is no gain in silence and submission. We can't move along if we just stay quiet in our chairs. So what we've done in ANA, and this is quickly, I'm going to try to quickly do this political thing, is we try to build friends in Congress to help us. Because unless you have <coughs> friends and constituents to help you move that, you're not going to do it. Right? So what do we do? We endorse candidates. People, I can tell you, people say to me, why does the ANA support a presidential candidate? Why do they endorse a candidate? It's a risk. It's a very big risk. But the reality is we endorse candidates who believe in our philosophy. Mm -hmm. And we believe if you believe in our philosophy and you have some of our values, that you, when you get into office, you will support them and advance them. If you're not, it's no loss because you weren't going to do it anyway. But at least gives us an in with whoever wins to say, we supported you, they remember you. They, Believe me, candidates want ANA to support them because what are nurses? They're like the highly trusted individuals. To say that a nurse is supporting you is very big. Some of them don't want even money. And I will tell you, the Obama campaign does not accept PAC dollars, and they don't meet with lobbyists. So I had, I shook hands with the president in an open forum, but I could not be in a room and, and shake his hand. I could not be in a room with Obama alone. <laughs> so anyway, we do endorse candidates on only on the federal level, running for the House or the Senate. And you know, if we elect people to office that believe in, in what we believe in, that you know, we will have more champions for our issues and our causes. And so we, so we work hard at educating members. We find pro nurse candidates, and we identify committees to support. 
We do give to the Democratic Committee and the Republican Committee because we are a bipartisan pack. You have to understand what the demographics are in that district. You have to understand that time is money um, in a race. Um, we try to target some really good win areas. We take, we've taken a lot of risks this year because we, we endorse about 100 candidates and we did endorse the president in May. In May we endorsed him. And we believe that's a way to influence the process. It's the people, remember I said, I'm, once I elect them, I'm no longer able, I can talk to them, but they're the ones making the decisions, they're the ones who are voting, I have to. So if you can support them, you can get your people to engage in their campaigns, gain their support, and while you're engaged in those campaigns, you can educate them on what's important to you. You can teach them something. Certainly in these campaigns, they all want support from their political parties. The Democrats are looking for the, the support from the DNC and the Republicans from the RNC. And endorsements, many of them really want endorsements so they could say, these people have endorsed me, so I am good, trust me, okay? <laughs> so we do have an extensive process to, um, I don't just look at a guy or gal and say, hey, I like you, we'll endorse you. They go through a process where we interview them. We ask them, we have a questionnaire, it's online. We, um, we ask our states, those who have state associations, what do you think about this candidate? Because I'm not living, we do, we do them out of our central office, but I don't live there. And you know how campaigns are, they turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. How much dirt comes out at the at last few days? Oh, <laughs> such and such had an affair or whatever. And that comes out and all of a sudden that campaign's down. So we always ask to say, any late breaking news out there? What do you think about this candidate? Do they, do they talk to you or do they just brush you off because they're not interested in nursing? So is that somebody you want to elect to office? No. They, we put all this information, bring it to a PAC board, and they approve it. And then at the end, we always go back to the state and say, what do you think? So we give them money and we give them support. So we do have a day that's coming up October 17th. It's on our website. It's Nurses Can. We hope that all of you engage. It's commit to working at least an hour or two at a campaign, any campaign of your choice, federal, state, local, school board, whatever. Our job is to make sure that nursing has a presence in all campaigns. So we are asking people to help with voter registration if that's still going on. We want them to volunteer on campaigns, and we want to do fundraising because, you know, it also helps when you give money to a candidate. Sometimes they need money. So, all right, so here's a race. This is, I brought this up because, I don't know, this is New York. Dan Maffei lost last in the 2010 election to Anne-Marie Burkle, who is a nurse. Okay? We didn't support her, and we're not supporting her this time. And we've talked to her, and we tried to develop a relationship, but she opposes the Affordable Care Act, which is our main provision. She is a nurse, but she doesn't usually say she's a nurse. <laughs> um, so um, she's running on a Republican ticket. She's not fundraising very well right now. And Dan Maffei lost by a small, uh, what do you call it, a uh, margin. margin. And so we are supporting him in this race. He gets it, he understands our issues, and so we have gone on a limb and supported him for his race. What does uh, rated lean Democrat mean? Uh, rated lean Democrat is that that, it, that district will probably, it, it, it will go more towards the Republican side rather than to the Democrat side. So there's a likelihood that more people in that district will vote for her. So that's why it's a risky kind of proposition. So remember they did, redistricting this year. Yeah. So a lot of people yeah. change the districts, change the nature of their constituents, mm -hmm. and whether they're Republican or Democrat now, now they have new districts and they have different things to contend with. So that, that was... So here's Congresswoman Capps, who is a Democrat. She serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, a very powerful committee. She's been our go-to gal since 1998. She's a school nurse. We have supported her, but they redistricted her. She's in Santa Barbara, and she is running the race of her life. The reason she got into this campaign was her husband was a member of Congress. He was going home for a weekend. They lived, you know, after a session, and he had a heart attack at National Airport and died. And they always had this belief <laughs> together that they wanted to be public servants. And so when he died, she 
ran in a special election for his office and won. <coughs> and she is the co-chair of our Congressional Nursing Caucus. So she is running for office against Lieutenant Governor Maldonado. And it's rate the even though it's it's um, rated a lean Democrat, it's a very, very tight race. And he has as much name recognition yeah. as she does. And so it's been a battle. It's been a battle for her. And so we're trying to do everything we can to support Lois Katz, because she is a gem. This was the other co-chair of our nursing caucus, and his name is Stephen LaTourette. He's a Republican from Ohio. And what happened to Stephen LaTourette is he got tired of being called a rhino, which is Republican in name only. And so he decided that he was not going to run for office. And we were like, <gasps> He's a Republican who's a co-chair of our nursing caucus, and he was a moderate Republican. And he said, you had 50 or 60 folks who wouldn't vote for the team, that's new. You couldn't get an aviation bill, you couldn't get a Ohio bill, so things we used to do all the time, a no-brainer way, we can't get done. That's for somebody who's been there a while, who has seen the changes. And I would say on the Senate side, people are leaving on the Senate side for the same reason. It, it used to be... They may argue on policy issues, but they got along. I will tell you that we have seven nurses in Congress right now, some Republicans and some Democrats. Carolyn McCarthy tried to um, do a lunch for nurses, and the Republican nurses responded that they didn't want to meet for lunch. This is a true story. She told us in the fundraiser, I tried, I made several limitations. They don't even want to sit at the table to have lunch as nurses. When it's when you can't even come together on common ground, it's almost impossible. Yeah. Here's another one who's running for Senate, Bruce Braley. He's a very he supported the Affordable Care Act. This is just a little glimpse into we support candidates. People get mad at us because we support candidates. But we have realized through the years that unless you nurture these relationships and support people that have your values, that support your issues, you are not going to have champions to support, advance your issues in the legislature. I want you to remember this name, Allison Schwartz. She was charged this year with trying to recruit candidates to run for office. She is an up-and-comer. I actually worked on her campaign. I don't remember. Must have been 2004 election. Oh, yeah, because I was ha had the carry signs, I think in Philadelphia, and I went to Buck County, where she's from, and we were stuffing envelopes. And she's a very big supporter, but she's also one who wants to rise in the ranks. So you start to support other candidates, raise money for other candidates, but she gets our issues, and she's uh, our lead on a home health bill. And so we are watching her and supporting her, and she's there for the long haul. You know, I could see her in the future trying to be another Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. or at least becoming a, a minority leader, majority leader. Okay, here's one of the other nurses who ran for Congress. She's from North Carolina. Her husband's a surgeon, and her platform was to defeat Obamacare. And so now what we're seeing where we only had three nurses on the Democrat side always talking about nursing issues, Republicans have other nurses who speak against the issues we were for. And they're leveraging the nurses. It's a very interesting dynamic. Watch how many times the Republican nurses are on the floor of Congress speaking on a health issue. It's very interesting. This is another one. Uh, she is on the, she's also a nurse. She's on uh, serving on uh, Ways and Means right now. And uh, Tennessee didn't want her, and they shipped her our way. And I said, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And now she's on a big committee. And the Ways and Means Committee is the committee that, overseas Medicare. We endorsed the president, just so that you know, we endorsed President Obama, and we're very excited about it, and I'm trying to get nurses to work around and support his campaign. This is a little bit, I, this slide, this will stay with you, um, this is a slide on differences between their positions. So a major difference is that President Obama believes health care should be done at the federal level, and uh, Romney believes that it should be done on the state level and that we should have the market. And my answer to that is the market had a lifetime to do it. Exactly. And the states had a lifetime to do it. Why haven't they done it? Right. 
and why so many people remain uninsured. And so that was, I was yelling that at the iPhone when I was watching the debate. Like, come on, come on, get in there, get in there, pick up the glove, get in the right. Um, so, you know, we are the experts. Don't underestimate your individual power because you have it. But be informed and have a collective voice. We know we got to come together. Remember, if you're absent, or if things happen. You will lose things. You will, won't gain things, and you might lose things. And your um, membership in a professional association can help to address those issues. And these are just some resources on nursing world. These are just resources. This is my action. This is my uh, nurse. NSAID is Nurses to Cheek It. Strategic Action Team, which is really about our online <laughs> grassroots resources. And these are links. And, you know, we can influence who constructs the work. And yeah. if you don't take responsible responsibility for your profession, nobody else will. So. <laughs> <laughs>